I'm Barry Breen, and the CEO of 3G Solar Photovoltaics in Jerusalem. And uh, we have developed printed solar cells, uh, which use organic dyes to convert uh, sunlight to electricity. What you see here are a large glass panels that we've put up on our roof. Uh, these glass panels are made of our uh, dye solar cells. Uh, we've also uh, uh, transferred this technology onto uh, plastic substrates. So we have both uh, glass substrates in large area and also plastic. And uh, we're looking at this technology uh, as a way to integrate it into buildings rather than placing the solar cells on top. We can provide these in various colors uh, and uh, they perform very well in all kinds of uh, lighting conditions. They can be opaque or transparent. So I'll tell you a bit about what a dye solar cell is. And uh, Eli had uh, mentioned that uh, you don't have to have a PN junction to make a solar cell. Well, that's absolutely our case here, no PN junction. Uh, it uh, looks completely different from a silicon solar cell. It's in fact an electrochemical device. We have uh, two electrodes and an electrolyte, and in that way it's much more like a battery or fuel cell uh, or a supercapacitor than it is a uh, silicon uh, solar cell. We have a, a, a electrode which is made of a nanoparticle titania in a porous structure, several microns thick, but the nanoparticles in fact are around 20 nanometers in size. And this entire porous structure is coated with a dye which is actually doing the work of absorbing light and converting it to electricity. Uh, we have a counter electrode which, uh, so once it goes through the external circuit, it comes back to the electron back to the uh, counter electrode through this electrolyte, which is in fact doing the work of regenerating the dye. So if we look at that uh, a bit more closely from the energetics uh, standpoint, so again we have a photon coming in. It's exciting the dye to a level which is above the conduction band of the titania. And this allows it to inject an electron into the titanium conduction band, which then diffuses out to the external circuit back through a catalyzed counter electrode to the electrolyte. In this particular case, as an example, it's a uh, iodide triiodide redox electrolyte. And this electrolyte is regenerating the dye so that it can go through the cycle once again of, a, a, of excitation, a electron injection, and regeneration. The voltage uh, that you can get out of the system is uh, the difference between the Fermi level, which is close to this conduction band, and the redox energy level. So you can see the voltage of the system here. Now, dye solar cells have actually been uh, under development in many laboratories for over 20 years, and it's been difficult to actually commercialize them. Uh, one of the uh, uh, barriers to that commercialization is to scale up the cell to large size. Silicon cells, in order to uh, extract large amounts of current from a large silicon cell, they have silver grids which have been printed on top of the uh, silicon cell. Uh, so this would be an obvious way to take the uh, research cell, which has been worked on in many laboratories, to the size of the cell that we've developed at 3G Solar. This is a full-size cell, 15 by 15 centimeters, the same size as a commercial silicon cell. The problem is that the uh, electrolyte, which does the work of regenerating the dye and does it very well, is also very good at dissolving metals. So uh, as a result, uh, the silver, that, for instance, that is used in silicon cells cannot be used here, nor can copper or nickel or even gold. So the uh, challenge is to find a, a conductor system which has good conductivity. It is uh, completely stable in the electrolyte system. Uh, and it can, uh, there's a process which can actually apply it in the cell. And these are actually the challenges that 3G Solar has solved and allowed us to uh, reach a size which is actually the largest single cell uh, dye cell uh, in the world and it generates the most current. Uh, I, here I review some of the other uh, uh, problems that we've solved to get to this a very large uh, uh, dye solar cell. 
Uh, we've uh, also created a, a very efficient seal for these cells. Again, we have organic materials and, and an electrolyte inside. So it's not, it's not obvious that you can actually get good durability out of these cells. Uh, we have a sealing system which is actually sealed in the, the materials very well and protects them. And we've also improved the output of the cells through a uh, multiple layer uh, titanium electrode. Again, the titanium electrode is the active uh, material with the dye that's actually generating the charge. Uh, we've also uh, reduced cost of this cell, uh, whereas uh, in academia it's uh, uh, typical to use pl uh, platinum as the catalyst for the counter electrode. We're using carbon, and we've done this very successfully with the same performance uh, that uh, one gets from uh, platinum uh, counter electrodes. And uh, where uh, in doing this uh, development, so we actually had to develop the pace ourselves because we didn't have, have access to such materials to our requirements uh, from the outside. So we've uh, developed the conductor pace, uh, titania pace, carbon layer pace, uh, and we continue to improve these to uh, boost the uh, performance of the cell and its durability. Another aspect is that uh, in a, a typical uh, a small cell in research is a simple sandwich configuration. It consists of a uh, conductive uh, glass with the uh, active uh, dye and titania electrode and a, uh, another conductive glass with the uh, uh, platinized uh, a catalyst. Uh, we are able to work with a single conductive glass which reduces the cost uh, of the uh, cell fabrication. And uh, then we take these large cells and we can uh, convert them into modules by stringing them together in a fashion similar to what is done with silicon. Another uh, uh, achievement that we have is uh, to uh, be able to actually immobilize the electrolyte in these cells without losing any performance. Uh, the typical uh, electrolytes are very liquid, uh, they're, uh, they're, uh, uh, not, they're non viscous uh, materials. We're actually were able to gel this to a semi solid uh, without any loss in the performance of the system. So here I just review the uh, way that these cells are manufactured in our laboratory in Jerusalem. So we start with a, a conductive glass. Uh, this is uh, using a tin oxide, fluorinated tin oxide glass. Uh, uh, we find that this works very well. It's a much uh, lower cost material uh, than ITO. Uh, and we print on that the titania paste and fire it. Uh, we apply the conductor system, which is a proprietary to uh, 3G solar. Stain the, the uh, titania with the dye, and it's actually diffusing again into a very porous electro coating all the surface of these nanoparticles. Apply the counter electrode, seal it, and, uh, and uh, put in the electrolyte, and then we're ready to test. So that is the basic uh, format for producing these cells. You can see there's all printing processes, some thermal process, some uh, wet processes, no vacuum processes. So it has the potential to be a very low cost system. So I'll just summarize very briefly where we stand today in the uh, R&D that we're doing uh, at 3G Solar. Uh, with our particular system, uh, and again, it's designed to be able to scale into uh, production and uh, not just as a research result. We've uh, achieved uh, in smaller cells uh, over 10% efficiency. Just to put it in perspective, uh, the, in the uh, academia, what's been achieved so far is almost 13% efficient, uh, but here we're, uh, we're working with a, a cell structure which we're able to uh, scale up uh, in the future to full, full production, full-sized modules. Uh, our status at the moment on the large cells is uh, over 7% efficient. Uh, and these are producing about three amps of current from these cells. Uh, on the glass cells, uh, we've reached almost 8% efficiency uh, with a particular technique that we developed within the company. Another very interesting result, uh, and it, it has to do with the, some intrinsic characters, characteristics of uh, dye solar cells. Uh, I talked about the results in full sunlight, and we, do, uh, we are interested in, in applying it to buildings so that it's, it's uh, relevant to have both a long life and uh, performance under full sunlight. But we have another characteristic, which is the ability to generate, uh, high, highly efficiently, to generate uh, current in room lighting uh, so that it can actually be used inside buildings to charge uh, various low power electronics. 
it does, it does it much better than silicon. Uh, silicon uh, under low lighting actually drops dramatically in efficiency. Here we're actually making use of the spectral uh, uh, characteristics of LED and fluorescent lighting. It actually boosts the efficiency of these solar cells so that you can actually get a, a charge which could, could should, uh, uh, be applied to uh, devices such as uh, security cameras which are completely wireless to give it a bit of charge with a rechargeable battery inside, never have to change the battery. That was the aspect of efficiency where we stand now, uh, but even more important is where we are in terms of durability of these cells. Uh, they are uh, organic. They're not the same organic cells that Gita had uh, described. It's sort of more of a hybrid, but still they're having uh, uh, the organic dye and the uh, electrite, which is also an organic material. So it's a challenge to actually be able to show that you can get to a 25-year lifetime with this system. What we've so done so far, I'll show you two slides, uh, is uh, two years ago we put up our, our first uh, modules on the roof. So we recently took uh, one of these modules and uh, disassembled it so we could see what has actually happened to the cells inside. So what you have here is a graph of the efficiency uh, as uh, we measured after disassembly uh, and then uh, against the efficiency that it had when we actually put it up on the roof in Jerusalem. Uh, so after two years, you see that some cells have gone up in efficiency, some have gone down a bit, but on average there is no change. And this is after two years and I also have to point out that this module was not sealed. The cells are actually directly exposed to the Jerusalem sun in the summertime and the rain in the winter are directly in contact with the cell. The, the module's not sealed. We expect actually with the sealing to have even a greater uh, uh, durability result. But here we're testing the cell in a module configuration and we have an excellent result. But two years doesn't uh, prove that you can get to 25, so we also do accelerated testing. Uh, a typical test done with silicon cells is uh, 1,000 hours at 85 degrees Celsius. So you put in the cell in, take it out for 1,000 hours, see how much it's changed in terms of its performance. Uh, what we did was took that test, 85 degrees Celsius, and again, it's, these are organic materials, and we ran it for 7,000 hours. So we got a result that 88% of the uh, performance of the cell was still there after 7,000 hours at 85 degrees Celsius. So we would like to further improve that, but I do believe this is uh, probably the best result that you have anywhere for a dye solar cell in terms of its durability. All right, so since we're talking photonics today, so I've got a few slides uh, to uh, relate to the optical design of dye solar cells. Uh, here we see actually one of the uh, issues uh, of uh, dye solar cells, why don't they have higher efficiency today? Uh, the dyes uh, overall it don't absorb uh, very much in the near infrared. There is this one dye, but it's uh, a problematic in terms of its production cost. Especially if you look at the more common dyes, you see that they tail off uh, just beyond the uh, visible range. So uh, there's a lot of energy uh, in the near infrared, and we would like to actually collect as much of that as possible. So 3G Solar, we're working with uh, partners out, uh, outside of the company to develop new dyes uh, that will be able to boost current and new electrolyte systems can, that can boost voltage. But in the meantime, we look for ways to be able to extend this just as much as possible with the existing dyes. And for that, we look to uh, optical layers that can uh, reflect light back into the system. I would point out these electrodes, the, again, the titania is 20 nanometer size, so uh, this, they're very transparent. So by uh, applying an optical layer, uh, so light that goes through, anything that is not absorbed has a chance to be reflected back by this optical layer and to boost a bit the uh, efficiency of the cell. Uh, we have our own formulation for this optical layer, but it's similar to these uh, particular examples which uh, show uh, uh, rather than nanoparticles, these are uh, uh, submicron particles in a range of 80 nanometers to 400 nanometer uh, size so that they can actually reflect, refract the light and, and scatter it and move some of it back into the uh, active layer. Uh, you can see that in fact this does work. Uh, this is uh, uh, the conversion, the uh, conversion of uh, the photons to, uh, to electrons as a function of the uh, uh, wavelength. 
so that you do get a bit of uh, uh, more uh, power, out, more electrons out of the cell uh, by using such uh, scattering layers. Uh, however, it uh, perhaps is more of a way to reduce cost of the cell, more so than getting a really big boost uh, uh, of the efficiency. So if you have a very thin uh, uh, nano titania layer, in this case four microns, uh, with the uh, optical scattering, you can get 50% more current out of the cell in this particular example. Uh, if you already have a thick layer, then the increase in the current is not so much. You have an increase, and in fact, all of the champion or the uh, world record cells that have been produced have been using this scattering layer, uh, but it's uh, not a very large gain. So uh, one can ask, what, what else could be done in optics? I mean, this is actually a very simple sort of way of doing it, put in some you know, submicron particles on top. Uh, can we be more sophisticated? And in the dye cell research world, many uh, things have been done to, to, and tried in this way. I'll just give a, very briefly uh, a few examples of this. These are spheres built of those 20 nanometer uh, uh, nanoparticles. It's combining the scattering layer inside of the active layer. So these actually absorb the dye and yet they're built into uh, dense spheres which can scatter light. So this is, uh, gave an interesting result, but it's not something that actually gave a better result than the, the, the two-layer design. But it's a very interesting way that uh, these were made in terms of uh, to have these very dense uh, uh, spherical uh, spheres made of the nanoparticles. Uh, another uh, approach is to uh, put some order into the uh, uh, scattering, uh, to have uh, ordered crystals uh, or uh, inverse photonic uh, crystals so that uh, uh, to be able to, as the light comes to the uh, transparent layer, that it will be reflected back in and uh, moved and bounced around and, and to gain a, a bit more uh, current out of the cell. And uh, the last example that I'll bring here is uh, a multilayer. So uh, here we have, uh, on top of the, uh, the nano uh, titania layer with the dye, we have a multi-layer of silica and titania. And again, with the idea that this will uh, reflect light back into, a, into the cell as it comes through, anything that's missed should be reflected back and to make a gain on currents. But at the end of the day, I have to say that uh, none of these particular examples ever brought a, uh, a result which is a, more than the simpler scatter layer that I showed uh, previously. And uh, one of the thoughts I've had on this is, uh, you know, perhaps there's more that could be done. Perhaps in the dye cell world, we have uh, too many chemists working on these optics and not enough physicists. All right, so since I see that uh, you're standing there, we're about out of time. I'm going to go to my last slide and just give you a, a brief summary of where we stand uh, today in 3G Solar. So 3G Solar has developed the largest single uh, dye solar cell, and it produces the highest current of any cell that's, that, that anyone has shown to date. Uh, we're a leader in the durability of dye solar cells, and we've demonstrated that the technology it can also be transferred to plastics. We have both uh, the technology on class cells and plastic cells, plastic film. And we continue to make good progress on both the performance aspects of the dye solar cells and their durability. Uh, and looking towards the future, we're ready to go to market. Uh, outside analysts, market analysts have predicted that the dye solar cell can become a four and a half billion dollar market within a few years. And we expect that 3G Solar will be able to take a significant part of that market. So thank you and open for questions if there'll be time.